So I'm going to be talking about recent efforts at the Census Bureau um, that we've been working on lately. This is our most recent report, and we've been talking about the Interagency Technical Working Group and the document that they gave to us. Um, this is from that document where they stressed that unlike the official poverty measure, the SPM should change over time and that we should be working to improve the measure and we are interested and dedicated in doing that. So we've had a couple of conferences, um, sessions at conferences. This was at the Southern Economic Association meetings in November where we presented some of our work and more recently at the Eastern Economic Association, we had a session where we were presenting some of the things that we are doing. Um, and in general, I'm just gonna be summarizing some of the papers here. This isn't a list of all of the things that we think need improvement or need to be working on, but these are some of the things that we are able to do now. Um, first, I do want to mention, though, that we are doing something in the area of thresholds. BLS is doing a lot of research on the thresholds, but one of the things we're looking at has to do with geographic adjustments. So the geographic adjustments that we're currently using are based on information from the American Community Survey, the median value of reported gross rents. But a question that we have is what exactly are we collecting in the ACS when we're asking about rents? And a study done in 2010 by Julie Parker suggested that more households in the ACS are reporting the total tenant payment or the amount that people pay um, net of any subsidy that they get. So it isn't necessarily a gross or contract rent. And in fact, our instructions for the ACS are um, not definitive. In general, we're asking people to report the rent agreed to or contracted for, even if paid by someone else, friends or relatives, church or welfare agency, or the government through subsidies or vouchers. But on our Caddy Cappy instrument, we are telling people specifically to exclude any amount paid by a local housing authority or other agency. So this is something that we need to address that we're concerned about. Um, and we're using data, uh, linked data to HUD administrative records to the American Community Survey to sort out this issue. And we don't have any results from that study yet. So now I want to look at resources um, and some of our additions that we're making to income for the SPM. So we've been looking at, in, in the area of non-cash benefits, the value that we add for housing subsidies. So we know in the CPS, respondents are telling us whether they get help with their rent or they live in public housing, but they don't tell us the value of that subsidy. So we had Pat Ruggles at NORC review the method that we're currently using in the SPM to value housing subsidies. And we'll be um, getting some suggestions and recommendations. And in the process, of course, we found some small errors that we will be addressing as well. Um, the current method that we are using for the SPM, these are not the numbers that Bruce talked about earlier. Um, we've updated that method. So we're using a statistical match between the ASEC and HUD administrative records. We're matching to the HUD data using CBSA and household size. Um, when we get a match, we take from the HUD record the market rent for uh, a given unit. And then we calculate the total tenant payment by taking the difference between the market rent from the HUD record and the um, tenant payment, which we calculate in the ASEC, essentially 30% uh, uh, of um, income, adjusted income. And the result is the value of our housing subsidy. After that, we're making um, some other adjustments. If people say there are, they're living in public housing, then we discount that 
subsidy a bit um, because we think it's likely of lower value than if it's a voucher housing. And then we cap that subsidy at the portion of the SPM threshold that is housing. So it's never more than the need for housing in the threshold. So a paper um, by Trudy Renwick and Josh Mitchell used link data between the HUD records and the ASEC to evaluate our results from the statistical match. And basically they found that the um, statistical match is producing pretty similar results, um, pretty good results overall but that the report of whether people live in public housing or in, a, in a, getting help with their rent is inaccurate. And so we're reconsidering making that discount for the public housing subsidy that we have been making so far. In the area of subtracting from income and necessary expenses, um, you may know that the Census Bureau uses its own in-house tax calculator to uh, value tax liabilities and tax credits. And the question that we had, is this the best use of scarce resources? So we have a study um, from uh, Urban Institute by Laura Wheaton and <coughs> Catherine Stevens that have compared for us the output of our own in-house tax calculator to um, their trim model, TaxSim, and another Bakia model. Um, so far, it looks like there aren't very many differences in the output of any of those models. Um, so our concern now is more about the oper operationalization of what model would we use and how would we use it, the timing and availability of those models for a September release for the SPM. In the area of work-related expenses, so this is one that the, the interagency group had marked as uh, needing some work. So what we're currently doing is using the Survey of Income and Program Participation. We have information there on work-related expenses. We um, calculate for the entire country, all workers, a median amount. We multiply it by 85%. And then we use that weekly amount for each worker. Um, we multiply the number of weeks they reported working in the previous year. This is essentially um, what the National Academy of Sciences panel had done. And we continue to do that uh, with the SPM. Basically, what we're getting with this is the same dollar amount, weekly dollar amount for everyone everywhere, no matter where you live. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons that people are not satisfied with this particular method. Plus, we have now redesigned the SIP. So we're going to have some different estimates from the redesigned SIP, and we're starting to look at that. So we need to consider what we want to do when we're going to make a change. So we have two papers. Um, that have recently been presented by Ashley Edwards looking at some preliminary results from the SIP on work expenses. And a second one uh, by Brian McKenzie and Charlyn Bird looking at a new method using the American <coughs> Community Survey. So we'll be looking at these two methods and looking for input on what is the best way to go forward. Um, one thing with the redesign SIP is that we can take account of work schedules in the valuation of commuting costs. So we're able to see how many people are teleworking and what the extent of that is and how it affects uh, commuting costs. With the ACS, we can measure costs by geographic area. And so we can also take a, account of the availability of public transportation with commuting costs. So there will be two methods, um, and we'll need to decide what is the best way to go forward. Many people are in favor of incorporating the geographic variability in commuting costs 
so the ACS method is promising, but both methods are still using IRS mileage allowance to turn miles into dollars, and that is a value that doesn't vary by geography. <coughs> so in the area of data improvement, um, we've been looking at a lot of administrative records linked to the ASEC to examine the uh, quality of our responses and to move toward the idea of, a, of adjusting for underreporting at some point um, down the road. This last paper, um, the last bullet, looked at only individuals 65 years of age and over using administrative records. And this was a paper by Josh Mitchell and Adam B. Um, they used a variety of administrative records and essentially replaced the values for the reported amounts. And as you might expect, we see much higher median incomes and lower poverty rates from this activity. Um, the data that they looked at were before we had redesigned the income questions in the CPS, which we did in the 2014 ASEC. And one of the goals of the redesign was to improve the questions on retirement income. So we all know that with the SPM, we get higher poverty rates for that older population. And one concern is that we're not collecting retirement income uh, very well. So that was one of the goals of redesigning the income questions. But when we're looking at retirement account distributions and adding those to income, there's a conceptual issue um, that comes up because we can think of that as a drawing down of assets, maybe not necessarily income. And our Income definition typically does not include lump sum payments. It has to be payments that are regularly received. And if we're adding the retirement account withdrawals, then we're essentially double counting monies in the aggregate because we're also counting as income the contributions that younger families are making to those accounts. Okay, so I'm moving along. Um, so, we think in the context of the SPM, because this is what's available to meet your needs, we should be adding in those uh, retirement account distributions, but we should also be subtracting the contributions that younger families are making. So this year we've added questions to the ASEC about retirement account distributions. So we'll be looking at the responses to those questions. Um, also in the redesigned income questions, um, this has an important effect on MOOP because Medicare Part B premiums are a big part of MOOP for the aged population. We used to model the Part B premiums and in the redesign, if people reported that their Social Security benefit was net of deductions, we asked them the amount of their deductions. So we're now including that reported amount in our MOOP estimates. Um, looking at those responses, they look to be of good quality. They appear to be reasonable. So this year, we'll be asking the amount of Medicare deductions um, to everyone who receives a Social Security benefit. We also did make small changes in our MOOP questions, change the edit procedure, um, and a paper by Joelle Abramowitz looked at changes in MOOP between 2013 and 2014 when we had a full implementation of the ACA. Um, and we did note in our report last year that MOOP had a smaller effect on SPM rates in 2014 than in 2013. So we're also doing work in um, implementing the SPM and other surveys. Trudy Renwick will be talking tomorrow about the American Community Survey. We've done some work with the SIP, but since we're in the middle of redesigning the SIP, um, that work is kind of on a hiatus at this time. 
So one thing we're interested in doing is setting up a formal process for improvement. So we want to make sure that everyone knows what we're doing, that we have a lot of input, that we're making the right changes. We want to do this cautiously, not have a lot of changes um, from year to year. So we're looking for input about what is the best way to go forward as we make these improvements to the SPM. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>